Yeah, and what's up? My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm editor of IGN PlayStation. I'm here with Steve Butts. He's the managing editor of IGN. You might recognize this beautiful face because he worked for IGN for a long time. Now he's back. He's back in the fold. We're here to talk a bit about Assassin's Creed 3, and the reason, Steve, of course, you and I are talking about it is because we both went to school for history. So, right. so we, we have a little bit of knowledge. We also have a little bit of passion. Right. And something that struck us this morning about Assassin's Creed 3 was the announcement of uh, a new DLC pack for Assassin's Creed 3 that will come out later called The Tyranny of King Washington. What? And, and, and here's what Ubisoft, it, this here's how Ubisoft explains it. They say, as the revolution comes to a close, a new and most unexpected enemy emerges, driven by the desire to secure the fate of the colonies, the greatest hero of the revolution, George Washington, succumbs to the temptation of infinite power. The new king is born and his reign leaves no one untouched. To return freedom to the land, our new hero must dethrone a tyrant he once called a friend. Steve, how does that strike you, just, just right off the bat? Uh... From a purely speculative point of view, mm -hmm. like it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Like it's a really, really cool idea to uh, imagine this great figure from our history becoming sort of the evil that he fought to dethrone in the first place. Mm -hmm. My problem with it is that I don't know how they're going to make that leap, right? Because it seems like it's really going to have to change the character of George right. Washington fundamentally. Because here's a guy who, throughout his career, resisted the offers that people were making to him to give him this power, right? Yeah, I agree. I mean, that's what that's what stuck out to me, too. When you and I were kind of talking about it this morning, you know, I kind of, you know, went in and, and talked to some people and did a little research and kind of just started to remember some of my own my own studies, whatever, back in college. Right. And one of the stories that persists from the American Revolution is that George Washington was offered the throne, that he could have become king. This isn't really true. Right. I mean, you know, George Washington was never overtly offered to, to become king of the United States. They, they were... They were cognizant enough of what they were fighting to know that, that they shouldn't go back down that road. Um, and although there's some anecdotal evidence that he was maybe, it was talked to, a, uh, you know, maybe some of the founders were talking about it, some of his right. colleagues were talking about it, it was never offered to him um, like the presidency was. Uh, but at the same time, what you, what you just said right now sticks out to me too as well, is that everything he did leading up to the revolution, during the revolution and after the revolution, speaks of a man who didn't want power. And I think one of the things that sticks out to me most as well is that we can't quite understand today how well respected George Washington was during the American Revolution. This is a man of such prestige and power that has never, except for maybe Abe Lincoln, maybe a little bit of FDR or something like that. Right. We've never seen a man like that since. Yeah, I mean, he, he got unanimous election from the Electoral College. Right. Like, everybody wanted this guy to be president. The important thing to remember about the founders is, like, these guys were Republicans, and this is little r Republicans. These are guys who believed in checks and balances and separation of powers. I mean, they, they looked back to classical times to decide what kind of government should we have? You know, and they had 2,000 years of history to draw from, and they said, let's adopt sort of the Roman model, or the version of it that was uh, alive in England at the time, sort of English republicanism, where you have the people as sort of a democratic power, and then you have an aristocracy, and then you have a monarchy, right? But he never wanted to be a monarch. He never wanted to be a king in the old European style. He actually had to be convinced even to take a salary as president. He didn't want that before, and then somebody pointed out to him, well, if we don't pay the president, then only rich people will get to be president, right? Right, exactly. Um, and, yeah, I, I think that there's just he's just a selfless dude. And so I, I agree with you in the sense, like, how do we get to that point with George Washington? How do we get from a, a man who didn't want to be president, didn't want to be reelected, didn't refuse the third term, right. setting a precedent that everyone up to FDR followed, right. all these things? And, and where does the story turn? I imagine it turns some, turn sometime after Yorktown. Um, in the real history timeline. So 1781, uh, Cornwallis surrenders. 1783, we have the Treaty of Paris. Uh, the Continental Congress uh, gets together. They give us the Articles of Confederation. Probably sometime in between there and the, the writing of the Constitution in 1787 mm -hmm. is where this is going to take off. That's what's really exciting. I guess we'll see, Steve, where this whole DLC pack goes. Well, here's, here's where I think it's going to diverge, right? Because, yeah, he, he resigns in 1783 as Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army, mm -hmm. right? And he says at that time, I want to go back to my farm. Right, George Washington has been compared a lot to this figure, uh, this figure Cincinnatus from Roman history, and here was a guy who was an aristocrat. He hated the common person, right? But he was called upon by the Roman government two times in his life to be dictator, basically. Basically, whenever there was a big emergency in Rome and they needed to just get stuff done, they would give one guy absolute power. And Cincinnatus got this offered to him twice, and each time at the very end of the crisis. He gave up the power freely and went back to live on his farm. And a lot of people sort of see George Washington as a modern version of this figure, right? But 500 years later, they do the same thing to Julius Caesar, and he decides, I don't want to give up this power, right? And they form the Roman Empire at that point. So I figure, like, they're going to draw some parallels there. Maybe Washington is, like Caesar was at the time, worried about his soldiers. Because the Continental Congress had no money to pay these guys for all the fighting they had done for eight years. 
And George Washington fought with Congress a lot about this. I need my soldiers to be taken care of. And maybe that's a springboard. When he retires in 1783, he realizes, no, these guys that I have led in battle for so long are basically being sold out by the government that they fought to preserve right. or to establish. So maybe that's a that's an area where he can sort of change his character a little bit and still be the George Washington that we know. Yeah, I like that. I like that. It's it's, it's more of a populist rage, and I wonder where right. that leaves all of the founders, all his contemporaries, Hamilton and Madison right. and, and all these guys. It's really interesting. It's a great point. So we never even maybe get to the, Const the Constitution at all. Maybe something, right. is, something entirely different happens by the end of the 1780s. Steve, that was fascinating. I love history. You love history. Totally. We hope you love history, too. You should definitely love history. It's very exciting. For more things on Assassin's Creed 3 and all things video games, you should, of course, keep it tuned to IGN.com.